Um, well, thank you, everyone. Welcome to this panel. We are halfway into uh, the current legislative term, which means also we are halfway until the next EU elections and the new College of Commissioners. It is uh, therefore a good time for, for EDRI, for European Digital Rights, and other NGOs and digital rights uh, advocates to look backwards and also forward to analyze the, the impact, uh, adapt the strategies, and receive uh, constructive criticism of, uh, of our work. Looking backwards, and the purpose of this panel is to have an overview on how, how it has been for digital rights so far in the current uh, EU legislative term. This means how well have uh, digital rights been defended? Are we advancing? Are we creating more legislation that perhaps will never be enforced? Um, how are civil society groups doing? Are we being effective? Are we engaging with people outside the EU bubble? And also, how do the, the members of the European Parliament, also academia, see us? How do they perceive our work? This is looking backwards, but looking forward and um, being halfway until the next elections also means it is also a good moment to take uh, two, three takeaways of uh, what to expect uh, by 2024. So what is the next Digital Services Act type of legislation that is coming or what we should be, be pushing to, to, to be proposed by the next uh, legislative, by the next uh, uh, College of Commissioners? Or should we perhaps both policymakers and human rights groups focus rather in the implementation? We have the GDPR, we have the e-privacy sometime soon, hopefully the regulation, the DSA soon, the DMA, we have we in the process of adopting the, the Artificial Intelligence Act. And um, European Data Rights is also starting an internal review process uh, in, in this moment. And we're trying to take all of these questions into consideration. With this panel, we hope that we will be able to, to obtain some analytical and strategic tools for civil society to face the existing and future challenges that, that we are facing. And in order for this panel to be relevant for all of us, I, I'd like to encourage self-criticism of strategy, uh, strategies and acknowledging what could, have been, be, what could have worked better. So we can address these failures in our current and future work but also to recognize all the progress that we have achieved so far. So summarizing some of the questions we are going to try to respond today is are the ones that I'm going to be placing in the chat. So how are the European Commission and the European Parliament standing in terms of di digital rights and policies? What are the biggest threats to the rights of EU citizens now halfway at the halfway point to the next EU elections? And where should we focus our energies in 2024 and beyond. Um, as you know, um, my name is Diego Naranjo. I'm the head of policy of European Data Rights. I have four wonderful speakers coming from the European Parliament, from civil society and from academia. In the interest of time, I will avoid uh, reading any biographies. And I'm going to head directly to the first round of questions. I will start with you, Alexandra. Alexandra Gese is, uh, of course, a well-known MEP, a uh, member of the Group of the Greens, uh, European Free Alliance. She's uh, not only a member of the Internal Market and Consumer Protection Committee, where we all know her very well, she's also part of the Budget Committee and the Artificial Intelligence in a Digital Age Committee. And, and she's also a former interpreter in the European Parliament. And so, Alexandra, even though uh, you have worked in the EP before, this is, if I'm not wrong, your first term as an MEP, and you quickly show the interest in working on digital issues. Since then, and we know well you and your team, you have been working on very intensively on a number of dossiers, namely, but, but not only the Digital Services Act and the Inter Artificial Intelligence Act. So the DSA was voted last week, which marks a, a positive step forward to advance human rights online. I think it's a great victory for all of us. It is a bit clear, at least for me, where the AI Act uh, will be heading to. And now that we are halfway in the legislation, what is the balance? What is the balance so far for digital rights uh, generally for you? Um, thank you, Diego. Um, thank you for those kind words and thanks, thanks for having me here. Um, well, difficult question. Um, for me personally, I think the balance is positive because working on the digital services sect, um, I believe what we achieved last Thursday in plenary is, is amazing. It's a lot more than, than we expected when we started out. I remember when we started, when I started working on this 
the line was more, well, we have to defend the existing situation to make sure that liability exemption will hold and so on. And now we, we got really so much more. We got users rights, we got good notice and action, complaint management, um, out of court settlement. And we got what is even more important for the very large online platforms, um, we got the risk assessments and especially external scrutiny, even by independent researchers and by independent NGOs, which I think is absolutely a game changer. So I think the DSA will not, you know, it will not be felt maybe from the first day for, for individuals, but, but the structural change this will bring about that we can finally look under the hood of what these platforms are doing is, is really, really important. And um, that's, that is, I think, one of the areas where um, every, and we could focus or NGOs in general could focus the work on, try to, to hold, to be in touch with the networks of NGOs and researchers and universities all over Europe to define research programs, projects that you can do on the basis of Article 31, um, trying to tell the stories of what happens in the digital space and what is the influence on everyday lives of people and on politics. Because I think one of my difficulties, but everybody's difficulties with telling, um, with, with changing the political attitude towards digital policy is that it's so abstract. There's no images, there are very little stories except of individuals. And it's so difficult to tell the story because it's so complicated, you know, explain the DSA to a normal person, it's almost impossible. Um, it takes you 10 minutes and then person is not listening anymore. So I think one thing we, we, sh we should be doing all together is, is trying to tell the story. So if, for Germany, it might be, why do we have all these fans of natural medicine from the south of Germany who are marching in the streets against COVID just together with Nazis from the east or other places? You, you know how, and this is about targeting. This is a digital topic. Um, but as long as you don't have the research to back it up, so you need the evidence, you need to access to the data to have the evidence, and you need to be able to tell the story and you need to be able to tell a story about real people in order to, to elicit emotions and then people will be ready to act. So I think that is that is a really important task for, for NGOs and for Edwi to look around. I mean, who are interesting people who are into NGOs interested in doing this, telling them about this possibility that DSA offers, and maybe try to see who are the universities that are maybe not funded by Google and Facebook and who could do the research part, the mathematical part, the data analysis, and so on, you know? I think that's that's one thing that is that is really important. Um Maybe I have to. Well, I, I, maybe I, I just stop here because with so many people on the panel, I have more points. But I, I just stop here for the moment. Okay, that was good. I was uh, looking forward to see what you were going to follow. Up. Let's leave it for later. And Asha, perhaps we can continue with you, uh, because uh, I think what uh, Alexandra was saying on the the need to to uh, to tell stories, to to find the evidence, and make uh, all of these digital rights. Uh, abstract type of uh, policy uh, policy speech and uh, making it a bit more concrete for people and, and you you come from the European women's lobby where you joined uh, and you were already working on digital affairs and you joined the uh, CDTs uh, last year you were the advocacy director of uh, for Europe online expression civic space at CDT for those of you who do not uh, know her yet um, so what do you think how how can we start uh, telling stories how can we build Build on the evidence that, that we we are gathering. Some of us are either researchers or in this society are gathering evidence. So how can we tell better these stories, and and, and how does it, uh, especially for in, in the case of marginalized groups and for people on the ground, and how can we make them involved in the in policy making? Since sometimes or very often they are the the most impacted by some of the of the digital rights policies. Thank you very much, Diego, and, and thank you for the invitation to speak on this uh, really important panel. I'm so honoured to be uh, supported by so many uh, uh, allies here. And as you mentioned, kind of coming from that gender equality, digital rights expertise background, it really was at the foundation about seeing the intersections between digital rights policies and existing uh, equality legislation, equality laws and existing equality policies. For those of us who've been in that online gender-based violence space, especially for the last kind of five or six years, back in 2017, it was still like a niche 
subject. We had some political awareness, uh, mainly from politically engaged women who unfortunately had first-hand experience of the issues that we were talking about. Um, but the small communities who focused uh, on online gender-based violence couldn't have imagined that we were having the conversations that we're having right now. And that's because of the uh, political willingness that we have seen, which I think taps into where we are in the middle of this term. We are seeing a lot more political willingness um, from champions uh, such as Alexandra in the European Parliament, but in the European institutions. And I think as civil society, we are always hoping for that political will to be there so that we're able to move that needle forward. But specifically when it comes to, to marginalized groups um, and tapping into that conversation on fundamental rights, I would actually say we need to go beyond stories. Because at this moment in time, I think st stories very much give a personality to the abstract. And this is incredibly important. Agreeing, trying to explain the DSA in short, concrete terms and how this directly impacts on a person can be quite difficult to do. But when you're looking at it through an intersectional perspective, an intersectional lens of looking at the impacts of the things that we're talking about on marginalized groups, this is where you can get a better shape of what we're looking at here. But the reason I say that we also go beyond stories is because we also need to go into the adoption of a clear intersectional methodology in our policy making, and also need to be very, very aware, um, and just to be quite truthful, that the EU policy making space and the tech space and the digital rights space remain somewhat homogenous. Um, I work with a group of incredible activists on the Who Writes the Rules campaign initiated by Digital Action. And this is a group of six women of color who are calling on the EU institutions to do better on their commitments when it comes to inclusion of marginalized groups. Often we may be invited in the room to share our stories, but it needs to go beyond that. It needs to go into helping with the policy making and the decision making and the analysis and being there as the researchers as well at the same time. So it's a multifaceted approach. So often when I have this conversation, I always remind people that intersectionality is a concrete methodology and framework for analyzing the interplay between class, race, and gender. It's not a checklist exercise when you kind of refer to marginalized groups, but it's an actual strategy that you could put into industry, into policy making, um, and into research as well. So it's quite important. We have to maximize on the opportunity that we have where fundamental rights has been at the core. Some of the conversations around the Digital Services Act, for example, I think so many of the wins that we saw from the plenary last week were based because we had people really championing fundamental rights in this legislation. But we can go a step further um, and really think about what are we talking about when we say fundamental rights? Whose fundamental rights? And how are those different rights interplaying with each other? And how do they manifest in real terms? Thank you, Asha. And that's uh, actually a very good uh, um, link to, to bring Yoris Van Hoboken with Asha. He's a previous uh, doc post postdoctoral research fellow at the Information Law Institute at New York University. Uh, but we, we have met, met before. I, I met uh, Yoris when he was still at the board of our uh, directors of the Dutch Digital Rights Organization, Bits of Freedom, for which he was uh, the chairman. So he was a, a long time Edri, Edri friend. And so, uh, Yoris, I think you, you also were interested in, in, in this issue of the fundamental rights being at the core of uh, EU tech policy making. And, and when we were, we were preparing this panel, you were mentioning how it was in a bit uh, surprising how uh, fundamental rights are, have become so central in, in this discourse. So, uh, how, how do you see this change in policy making in the last uh, 10 years? Is it a, a change? Is it a real uh, concern for fundamental rights? Is it just on the superficial level? Is it just a, a way to add in the, the end of some amendments and the respect of fundamental rights? And to, to do some sort of a, a tick box exercise, as Alan was uh, mentioning, what do you think? <laughs> well, th thanks first of all for, uh, for having me. It's a real pleasure. Um, also to be here with uh, amongst the other speakers. So uh, maybe the first I would say is that, you know, reflecting on the state of play from a digital rights perspective, from a perspective of, uh, of Edri, it just uh, strikes me that, uh, I mean, it's not the first time that we speak about uh, this, but there's really such an avalanche of uh, regulatory proposals and also other legal developments that are extremely relevant in this space. Uh, the targets uh, that are being regulated also are immensely uh, powerful and complex and very fast uh, moving. 
you know, both in the government space and in the private sector space. So uh, it's, uh, it's really, uh, it's a rather challenging uh, environment. And uh, I mean, we know that Europe and the European Union and the European Commission has this, you know, particular appetite to regulate, you know, because maybe other political tools like spending money in different directions, you know, that is not so available uh, to Europe. There's not so much flexibility there. So, you know, furthering the European project means typically that there will be more uh, regulation, more harmonization. Uh, but it's very striking how much on the uh, is there on the table. We have mentioned already a few uh, files that are very important, but there are a ton of other files that are very important from a fundamental rights perspective and a digital rights uh, perspective. And there's actually hardly anything uh, at the table nowadays, politically speak speaking, that doesn't touch, of course, on uh, the digital in one way or another. So a bigger reflection I have on that is that in my uh, view, uh, the digital transformation uh, presents... Uh, the European Union uh, with somewhat of a constitutional opportunity, like it's a constitutional moment to kind of re-articulate itself uh, in this time. You know, so, um, and, uh, and one of the ways uh, it, uh, I mean, it does that through a lot of these kind of regulatory proposals, very, very active uh, engagement uh, with, uh, with policy making, with new uh, legislation. Um, and what we can see is that uh, the digital uh, rights, fundamental rights, have really become very, very central to that regulatory pro project of uh, 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 articulating Europe uh, with respect to that uh, the challenges of uh, the digital transformation. And, and that is uh, quite different, I think, if we look back uh, 20 years ago. And if we look longer back, of course, Europe and European Union had a rather ambiguous relationship with fundamental rights, you know, before the charter and when, you know, Europe was really much more about an internal market project, which of course it still is, you know, it is still, Europe is very much about uh, the digital single market, the digital, uh, the, the single market, uh, but fundamental rights have become uh, very central to that. So with that, I think also that presents uh, communities that are you know, really fighting for uh, fundamental rights in uh, protection, kind of to get them protected in very meaningful way, but somewhat of a challenge because like that fundamental rights becoming kind of a more mainstream um, uh, thing that is uh, that is on the table. So I do agree with, uh, with what was Asha was saying, that we have to be looking very carefully what uh, is actually meant with uh, protecting fundamental rights. You know, just to give one uh, particular example, in the context of the Digital Services Act, one of the fundamental rights that is obviously very much at stake is the right to freedom of expression. But how do we define that right? What is in the end the purpose of that right? Is it um, a very basic kind of uh, little bit uh, superficial understanding that any communication that is free and unhindered is uh, free speech and everything that has some kind of restricting effect on what people can say, you know, that is, a, uh, that is bad. So more speech is good, uh, less speech uh, restrictions uh, is, a, is a bad thing from freedom of expression. I think that is an understanding of freedom of expression that is typically furthered in a lot of conversations. But of course, it uh, disconnects us from what are ultimately the underlying goals of uh, freedom of expression. And, and obviously also it can easily create dynamics where uh, marginalized groups are being pushed out of the public debate, um, where, um, you know, actually we don't get uh, uh, the voices that uh, we should all be hearing you know, in, uh, in our public uh, discussion. So I think that is, uh, that is super important with fundamental rights going mainstream. I think it's the role of ADRI and other civil society actors to, to really uh, to, 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 to articulate what these rights uh, should really mean uh, in practice. And uh, so maybe paying a little bit more attention to, to the politics of, uh, of fundamental rights uh, in, the, in the EU uh, dynamics. Uh, thank you, Joris. Uh, I'm going to uh, follow up now with Anna, but uh, for the rest of the speakers, feel free, please, to, to react directly to each other. Feel free to raise your hand either electronically on the bottom right of the corner or physically showing me your hand. 
um, because I'd like to keep this as an open conversation. But uh, let's let's uh, let's pass on first to to Anna. Anna Fielder, she's the our Edry president. She's also the currently the senior policy advisor and chair emerita of Privacy International, one of our members. Also the senior policy advisor to the transatlantic consumer dialogue. She covers all types of aspects of consumer policy, from regulations to digital rights, and she works also independently as a policy research advisor for other public uh, interest uh, organizations. So, so Anna, I guess you, you will have a lot of things to, to react to all of this. You, you have the two hats, uh, the US side and the EU side, you have a, a, an extensive uh, um, experience. So I guess you want to react to what our, our colleagues said already. Oh, thank you very much for having me. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm really pleased to be on such a distinguished panel with such brilliant colleagues. Um, I actually agree with parts of, of everything that my colleagues said previously on this panel. Um, so maybe I can connect in different ways. And since I'm the old ancient one here, and I was around and campaigning during the GDPR days, I can actually put my Edry hat on and, and maybe say a little bit what I think has worked for civil society and what hasn't, but also linking it to a lot of the messages that uh, were said previously on this panel. So what, what I've noticed uh, in the last 10 years since I joined EDRI and since we were campaigning on GDPR, um, what was quite remarkable during the GDPR campaign is that we had a lot of confluences of um, very good opportunity and in particular the fact that it was uh, the rapporteur for that uh, regulation was a very fundamental rights friendly a uh, supportive person, and and uh, I'm I'm obviously referring to um, Jan Albrecht. Um, at that time, Edri was a relatively small, under-resourced organisation. So having this kind of collaboration with a Libe committee and with a really um, friendly rapporteur was essential. Um, and that was very lucky, but it doesn't happen anymore. And it's not quite easy anymore, despite the fact that we've got colleagues like Alexandra Gies that um, is very supportive and, and, and very welcoming to civil society. Um, so the positive things that's happened is that the resources of uh, EDRI and civil society generally have increased considerably. So we can devote more times to campaign, more times to telling stories uh, like the, the Citizen um, Defend Your Face campaign. Um, we can form more alliances and that's another good thing that happened that the more and more NGOs that don't come from the expert digital rights field uh, can actually relate much more to digital rights and they can tell a story much better than us. I mean, um, to some extent, uh, for it, to give you a concrete example, um, in, in the UK when it was still a EU member, uh, when we were uh, arguing for the DPA Digital Protection, uh, Data Protection Act implementation, we managed to get through a lot of positive changes by telling the children's stories. Children are always a good um, constituency to tell stories. You know, when uh, in my old days, they used to say, if you want a politicians to make changes, find children, animals or dead bodies. Um, and, and this is probably <laughs> still true today. So I think, uh, you know, we've, we've seen a lot of progress on the part of NGOs, but I've also got very deep questions of where we go in the future. And it is linked to something that Yori said and also what Alexandra has said. Uh, we have a tsunami of legislation. Uh, there's more coming down the line on different aspects of, of digital. It, it's all pervasive. 
we spend a lot of effort on the European Parliament legislation, detailed comments on all the amendments. Do we really need to do that in the future? Or is it something much more effective that we can do, uh, for example, on the alliance side, on the campaigning side, on the storytelling side, on what Asha is saying, you know, finding the right visions, and and also, you know, I would I would like to know: Do we need this tsunami of laws? Because uh, whatever happens in the next ten years, there's more coming down the line. There's the um, the driverless cars. There the robots. There's even smarter cities, and do, you know, do we need to concentrate more on the fundamentals and and find something? overarching and visionary that can sort uh, the fundamental rights, the economics, the ethical aspects, um, and so on. Maybe I'll stop here because I got lots more to say, but I, I don't want to speak too long. <laughs> Okay, every speaker ends with a fantastic cliffhanger, uh, letting us there. We need to hear more from them. Uh, Alexandra, you, you're the, the policymaker in the room, and and all, many, if not all of the speakers have mentioned the tsunami of legislation. So I'd like to hear how do you see that specifically? You want to react to that? And also uh, a bit uh, different, I'd like to, to see um, uh, to hear from you. Uh, and I, the first time I met you, I, I realized you were uh, very direct, very critical, which is fantastic. And so I wanted to hear from you. I'd like you to be <laughs> critical and direct. Um, since the beginning of the of the uh, of your uh, this legislative term, when you became MEP, you were very receptive to, to NGOs who worked on, on topics such as legal rights, and and you probably received many meeting requests, even more, in fact, from the industry. So there's no need to ask you if industry is more present than, than civil society, but I'd like you, uh, if you can, in addition to to reply to the tsunami of legislation, to to try to let us know. How do you balance the, the impact of, of uh, the, the tsunami of the, of the industry trying to act on the tsunami of legislation and the, the, the small but increasing group of digital rights groups? How do you see that? Yeah, uh, thank you for that complicated question. I, I start being a, lot, a little bit worried about all these people telling me I'm very direct. <laughs> I think that might, might be a lack of, of the diplomacy, diplomatic skills as well, but yeah, I take it as a compliment for this time. Um, there, there is indeed a tsunami of legislation coming, um, directly uh, political advertising, which uh, I think will give us the chance to reopen the battle on surveillance advertising, explaining even better, having even better stories and getting politicians even a lot more involved. So I think that is one. And the AI Act, obviously, is, is the big one that everybody's already working on. And, and, and it's, it's a tsunami even for us because even we, you know, we are paid for just doing that and have a team to do that to sort of lose um, control over what's going on and can't, can't cover everything. Um, in terms of, um, I, I really don't know how to solve the problem that, Obviously, companies have a lot more lobbying power than than NGOs. I mean, I personally try to say, you know, my team um, is supposed to organize meetings, 50% civil society and 50% companies. Um, but the requests that are coming, it's like 98% come from companies and we ignore like hundreds of them. So it's, it's really difficult and I don't know how to solve that. I mean, there are specific issues in specific countries, like in Germany, we, in Germany, we have fiscal issues and so on. But I think on a European level, I, I, I just don't have the solution um, to, be, to be very, very honest. I just do what I can to, to have you on board to talk as, as much as possible. Um, I think Anna made an important point saying, well, maybe we don't need to do detailed comments on every single amendment. I mean, I think it, you as like the, the same way that I have to prioritize and I just can't do everything I know would be helpful. And I try to pick just this, this one, two, three important political points and to work on those. I think that's what, what you can do as well. 
what has been very successful, I think, in this term, especially around surveillance advertising, um, which is the campaign that I've been, you know, pushing and following most, was the alliance building. I mean, that was really exceptional, like five NGOs working together. So maybe you can use that for some kind of division of labor. So some people in one law specialize in, in one aspect of it and others in others, you know, just do some division of labor. And so, because just very frankly, policymakers don't read a hundred different comments on 3000 amendments. There's just no way to do that. So maybe it's important to pick those aspects that you specialize on, exchange a little bit with other NGOs, um, and then Put that forward. I mean, that's probably what you're already doing. But I, I, I have seen very long comments from from your part, and and I know how much work is involved. And maybe there's a way to deal with that with that better. We won't solve the problem that Google has so much more money than Edry. That's you know nobody has the solution. Of us, I think. Um, there, there are a couple of more points I wanted to make. I think Joris' point about what exactly is freedom of expression was extremely important because that's something I've been particularly struggling with and some of you have followed that um, with, with the issues on the porn platforms where we clearly have that, that issue, what is freedom of expression? Is it just being able to post and say and post any image you want to you wanna post or is it about giving, making sure that everybody is included in the conversation and that today is not the case. So I think an organization like Edwi has a really important role in, in taking this conversation forward because nobody has the exact solution for that. Um, two more um, points like that where I think the conversation is shifting and where I, I really appreciate your, your contribution is that when I started, privacy was very much seen as, as an individual right. So as long as I, as an individual, can protect myself from being spied on, everything is fine. And I think what we're seeing now is that privacy is something that preserves democracies because it keeps governments, but also public, private companies from manipulating society as a whole or larger population groups. So I think that is that is a, a, a paradigm shift that still needs to be pronounced more clearly and made made more more clear and open and be worked on and discussed. That privacy is really not only an individual instrument, but it's a collective instrument to protect democracy. And the other one is that privacy is important to um, to implement not only against governments but against private actors as well, because what we see today is that the platforms, private actors are more powerful than most governments actually. And that is something that not everybody who, you know, is, is an activist in terms of digital rights is, is sharing as a view. So I think that's, that's already also so very, very, very important. But um, yeah, that's, I think, basically my, my most important points. I have to say, I've been extremely happy um, about our cooperation working with you and the other um, NGOs. I mean, what we achieved in the DSA last week would not have been possible without you, absolutely not. So your role was, was absolutely instrumental, absolutely crucial, and I'm, I'm extremely grateful. So I, I'm not here to give advice, but rather to, to thank you for what you're already doing, and I think you'll be in a, in a great place to continue doing that. Thank you, Alexandra. I wish those were your final words and we can finish with that, but we're going to continue. Thank you for being both direct and very kind. And Asha, I, I know you wanted to, to react uh, to the tsunami issue and, and uh, how uh, all the harmonization and enforcement and implementation. What do we do with all of this? So yeah, I would love to touch on those issues, but I, I can't not take the opportunity to, to touch on the other ones as well. I'm just absolutely plus one, uh, uh, Alexandra there on the paradigm shift when it comes to talking about privacy, because one of the aspects that we've been following and kind of using the perspective that we have is that what is going to be the impact of these legislations on online civic spaces? We're in a context in which consistently we are looking at shrinking civil society space in Europe, but also globally. And so this is kind of the lens that we're looking through this. And it's so important that that collective dynamic is, is kind of understood because then it relates to what I was talking about earlier in terms of the, the impact on marginalized groups and, and how that manifests in that in that sort of way. Um, and once again, two plus one on the civil society collaboration, we've had the honor of working so closely um, with all of you uh, on these different pieces. And I think that's been the strength. 
Um, I come from a background in which working together, women's organisations having to come together, um, even on the minuscule amount of capacity and, and funding that's necessary and, and that's available to be able to, to work miracles. Um, and so this is really our strength, that coordination and, and coming together. But it's not just with the digital rights colleagues that we're maybe more familiar with. It is about those other organisations who are working on these issues from their different perspectives. I know that we're in close collaboration with, say, the European Disability Forum and, and anti-racism networks and LGBT networks and, and women's networks. And I think we really need to maximise on that. So maybe a thought in terms of what the digital rights field uh, can be doing next. I know we're already doing this, but we definitely have the opportunity to ramp up on this as we move forward. But when it comes to the harmonisation and the tsunami of legislation, I'm definitely taking that term with me, um, after this session. But I think the biggest thing here is around harmonization. I know we were kind of addressing this question on, you know, do we need more and, and, and what do we need to do? And when it comes to harmonization, I mean, there's the, the traditional EU sense of ensuring regulations are equally parachuted out into the 27 member states. But more importantly, I would highlight the need to harmonize between the different legislative pieces, uh, as Alexandra was getting to, that are, are coming up that may not even necessarily be at the forefront of the mind um, when it comes to this. So we have the online political ads, for sure. Um, and I think big questions are going to have to be addressed um, in this. And we'll be engaging quite a lot um, because there are, you know, how effective is this going to be? How much is it going to align with the Digital Services Act? Do the provisions make sense? And, and how do certain articles work? Um, and I won't get into the, the details of that, but we have some questions around how this will work and how it will be effective. But we also know that there's going to be um, a directive or some sort of legislation on, on, uh, on gender-based violence, which will include uh, obligations for platforms to address online gender-based violence. How is this going to work in line with the other legislations that we have on our hands? How is it going to be effective to actually help uh, survivors and have preventative measures to make sure that we are addressing the issues that we're trying to address? So this brings me all to the conversation around enforcement and implementation. And this is really where the meat of the bones are, I think, are for the next kind of two and a half years of this legislative term, really getting into that because... Having worked in civil society for a long time, um, I think when you have a piece of legislation that's well defined, it's fantastic. It's good to have the legislative clarity. It's good to have a framework that you can build upon and there can be enforcement and mechanisms outlined. But if it is not effectively, uh, effectively implemented, it's not going to have the impact that it's intended to have. And so this is where I think the shift and the focus needs to be throughout the next uh, the rest of this legislative term, but probably into the next one um, as well, about how do we enforce the mechanisms that we have spent a lot of time and a lot of energy into designing um, and making sure that they actively work. So whether we need new legislation in the, new le uh, in the next term is a very good question. Um, I think just in general, continuity of these five-year EU terms needs to be a fundamental thread um, that moves forward. But I would really just love to see the shift be there. How is this going to work practically and how are we going to make sure it's as effective as possible? Thank you, Asha. Anna, you, you raised your hand and I, perhaps uh, in addition to what uh, you might want to react to, uh, I'd like to also to hear your views on the issue of enforcement because, uh, uh, as you said, you were involved in the GDPR negotiations. I, I arrived halfway or, or closer to the end of the GDPR, but I'm also curious to see to hear your views on the issue of enforcement, but please go ahead. Yeah, I'd, I raised my hand because I wanted to react directly to what Asha was saying and continue that conversation, which is effectively about member states and then enforcement, of course. Um, we, we must remember that, you know, the, the EU does harmonization and regulations, but not all member states are equal. And by that, I mean in the way they interpret legislation, in the way they treat civil society, and um, in, in the way they are willing to enforce this legislation. And I myself come from Eastern Europe, um, so I'm very, very familiar with that part of the world. And as you know, what's happening now in Hungary and what's happening in Poland um, is, not, is not entirely, um, you know, conductive to social democracy, not conductive to implementation of these very valuable fundamental rights laws. So I think we need to very think very carefully and take that into account also in our NGO strategy. 
how do we engage uh, civil society, not just our EDRI members, but, you know, all civil society <coughs> in those country, in those countries to actually influence more and be heard more and be more developed because until we learn how to operate effectively in member states um, and you know in some countries we have very powerful members in you know in the Netherlands and France and so on but we don't in all member states and and those states come into trialogues they come and negotiate and they're very, very much influenced by their industries. Um, and, and we've seen many, many examples of that, including to come to enforcement, uh, what's happening with the GDPR enforcement in Ireland, for example, where economic consideration, the fact that these companies employ many, many Irish people have primary consideration over enforcement of the legislation. Um, so, so how do we deal with that? I mean, what's been really positive in the enforcement of GDPR has been this uh, very rapid development of so-called strategic litigation. Uh, we now have um, many uh, NGO organizations that engage in that. We, we actually have a specialist litigation member organization in Austria that does fantastic job. Uh, of course, I'm referring to, to Noib. But actually, is this the best way? Is litigation the best way to proceed? I mean, we've got the collective redress directive coming on the way and being implemented. And hopefully, that will mean that, you know, it will enable at least consumer organizations because even that directive is very restrictive. Uh, to take more collective redress or class action cases because a lot of the implementation problems with GDPR and other legislation like this, it doesn't show necessarily huge material damage to individuals. But when you take the collective of individual at mass, when you take the future of society and democracy into consideration, the impact is enormous. So I don't think we've solved the enforcement dilemma. And, and laws such as GDPR allow for too much flexibility uh, that poses too many challenges in enforcement. And litigation is one solution, but it's not ultimately the solution in, in my view. Yori, do you want to react to that? No, those those were all really great comments. I mean, I'm I'm wondering uh, what I was going to say. I mean, maybe. I mean that question of that question of enforcement. You know, like I mean, I think I mean I think the worry is that you can be very effective maybe at the European level, but ultimately those laws are not landing, and you know, like what is actually happening in our societies doesn't reflect you know the laws that end up need being adopted at the EU level, and. Um, and I think that is, uh, I think that is a real danger. I think with GDPR enforcement, the glass is also half full. You know, it's it's quite easy to 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 complain about a lot of the things that are are not going well. But there's a lot of attention also to the things that are not going well, which is a, a very good sign. Uh, and and I think uh, we're we're all learning uh, from that. The thing that I would say is that. It is very important to take a broad view uh, if you want effective protection of digital rights and effectuate fundamental rights protection more generally. I'm a little bit concerned about uh, the kind of outsized role uh, that is sometimes imagined uh, for certain uh, players, you know, like actually like civil society and academia, you know, they, they get this role in the, in the Digital Service Act. No, the idea seems to be that civil society and, 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 and academic organizations are going to basically systematically monitor all sorts of ways in which platform companies, dominant platform companies are presenting issues. And personally, my experience in academia is academics, they like to write papers about new stuff and then they will move on to new topics. So really 
doing systematic monitoring, it doesn't really fit, uh, let's put it very bluntly, the academic uh, publication business uh, incentives, you know, the business model of, uh, of, of uh, in academia. And I think for civil society, it's, uh, it's a little bit overstretched. And then, I mean, the DSA is a very good example of actually, it's a big, it's a big change. We're moving from this kind of self-regulatory status quo we're with a bunch of, you know, pressure, quite a bit of kind of pressure on companies to, 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 to regulate. We're moving to a place where we're going to have, you know, a whole bunch of obligations and public regulatory oversight. But what is, what is needed, of course, for that to function is a whole bunch of people that understand how that should function in key roles. You know, so what that needs is a whole kind of generation of people with the right expertise moving into these new types of oversight positions in uh, oversight regulatory agencies, but also in other key positions in other kind of stakeholders, you know, and even internal, internally, of course, to companies. And I think that is some, that is a place where, where in, in, in many ways, the real battle is, you know, that kind of building that, building that future expertise that is needed to understand uh, these issues and getting these people uh, out. So in, uh, that expertise is partly a legal expertise, you know, and the, the avalanche, you know, tsunami of uh, legislation, it uh, even means that experts, uh, relative experts like me, are struggling to keep up with what is uh, EU, EU law in my area? What is it actually, you know, like what, it, it really knowing the latest developing uh, developments and understanding the nuts and bolts of uh, protect particular legislative files uh, when they are uh, completed, but it's uh, um, it it is of course uh, a much bigger uh, challenge, you know. Like, and I think uh, so the, in in the legal domain and getting uh, legal and political talent, you know, lined up that that understands uh, all these dynamics. But there's a there's a bigger a much bigger. Uh, uh, challenge that uh, I think uh, digital rights organizations and the digital rights fields, activism field more generally can play a very important role is in, in, is in building that expertise and, and working also in that together uh, with others. It's a bit of a softer, it's a softer agenda, but ultimately it's a very, very important uh, political battle. And I'm a little bit worried that sometimes the battle gets lost there and keep like the, the, the people that are really understanding uh, things they're not uh, end up being the dominant uh, voices in, in some of those uh, agencies, so including like in the GDPR uh, space. Good point, I guess. So next up, uh, applying for jobs at the DPAs. Um, Alexander, you, you left us on a deep anger before. Do you want to follow up on that or do you want to react to any of the speakers? learning to unmute my microphone after two years of pandemic. Um, I, I don't remember what the cliffhanger was, but I, I certainly agree um, to what Joris just said, that we will need a lot of qualified staff on, on technical level, legal level, and so on to, to do all this oversight and all this monitoring. This is going to be a very interesting challenge. And it's something that Frances Hogan mentioned as well, the Facebook whistleblower and her hearing at, at the European uh, Parliament that there are very few people who actually know um, what kind of data did you do you need to ask for if you want to monitor the big platforms, especially Facebook and her you know, so that that is uh, is a very very interesting uh, very interesting question. Um, yeah, what what else? What was the cliffhanger? I don't think I love nothing that. precisely. You were saying that I have much more to say, but I will leave it uh, for later. But. Uh, Perhaps there was nothing uh, my, my first intervention, and I, I caught up with the with the second one. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I think the AI Act is going to be a really huge challenge because there I really see that the influence of industry is extremely strong because it is also so difficult to come up with alternative proposals. Um, for example, I, I was in committee before and we had um, the Director General of DG Connect speaking about AI and we could ask questions and one of the questions I asked was how can you 
involve affected groups of people. So the people who will be particularly affected by artificial intelligence are not the ones that are developing AI tools right now, because it's women, it's people of color, it's poor people, people with disabilities and so on. And they're extremely unlikely to be involved in the development of those tools and also in the regulation of those tools, but they will be most impacted and most negatively impacted. And how can we involve them in the first place? And he, he just ignored the question. Question. I have to say, you know, we have these formats like two minutes, two minutes, and then you ask three, two, three questions, so they pick the question they want to answer. <laughs> but I think nobody has a really precise solution how that, that could work. Um, you know, there's no ready-made solution where you say, okay, you put that amendment into the regulation and it's done. You have to sort of think out of the box and, and develop solutions, and I think that would be an interesting challenge as well for NGOs to sort of come up together to start this discussion. How could we operationalize fundamental rights and inclusion of everybody in the conversation? How, what does it exactly mean? You know, we are speaking a lot about redress and consumer organizations have the possibility um, to, to have redress, but I think that's not enough. I think we really have to come up with a solution because that's something the commission can't do. This is something that has to be done grassroots and by all of us brainstorming together and coming together and coming up with something that we then all defend. I think there is a chance to get things into the regulation, but we need to operationalize it and not just stay at the level saying, well, we want fundamental rights. And even the human rights assessment, is, it's a great thing, but then you come, then you have the problem, you know, which fundamental rights and where's the balance? It's too abstract. I think we need some very precise, concrete ideas to put into that regulation. And that's maybe something we, we could, you could do as NGOs and then come to us as politicians, discuss it, and see how we can operationalize it and, and pour it into, into amendments. Thank you, Alexandra. I very good uh, comments. We have only uh, five minutes left. Uh, I'd like to follow up on the issue of the human rights impact, impact assessment because I also struggle to, to imagine how they will look in practice and how will they protect people in practice. But uh, Yoris, you have the, uh, your hand raised, uh, so please go ahead and and after Yoris' uh, intervention, uh, I'd like to take 30 seconds each uh, to try to, to, to have a break. We, we were talking about uh, what happened so far, what's coming up in the media term, what NGOs should do. Um, but I'd like to, to think in uh, 2024, uh, uh, 2029 uh, legislative term and, and what, what to expect from that. Um, we were saying that perhaps we should focus on implementation, go to campaigning, go to, to national member state. But uh, whether we uh, like it or not, and I personally like it, the, the there will be a new commission, a new parliament. So we will need to say if we propose something or what we propose is uh, um, pushing uh, institutions to enforce the, the existing legislation. But Joris, please go ahead and then we go to the general question for hopes and prospects. Yeah, I just I wanted to say there's something about the AI Act that I think is quite uh, characterizes it a bit in a way, the dynamics, which is, I think this is a this is an, uh, an act uh, that has been put on the table mostly because it's been a big industry push to frame the conversation about, you know, certain kind of algorithmic systems in that kind of way. And the main goal for industry is to create predictable markets, you know, in Europe and, and mostly also like a, a, a one market for, for, for AI, you know, like and, and many, many different things. And, so there's many years that go before that and a whole kind of campaign and framing the conversation. And then at some point it lands and the European Commission comes with a proposal, you know, after the whole expert group kind of thing. And so that whole process before has been quite dominated by a particular framing coming, uh, the conversation coming from industry. So looking to the next period, I think, you know, Edri can maybe come together and, you know, put your heads together. What is one of those types of things that you want to do where you like really frame the conversation slowly and move, you know, towards uh, that type of target. I mean, there are some really important conversations happening now and you're doing a really great job on, but yeah, I think there, there is an opportunity uh, there, I think, to, to, to have a longer term kind of investment in building a file and working also then with the institutions that can, you know, that can help to maybe materialize that, uh, that agenda. Thank you, Joris. Um, Anna, I see you're already ready to react. <laughs> I think institution influencing is a really important future activity. Um, and there's also, you know, a really good expression for NGOs called watchdogs, 
you know, we have to be more watchdog orientated than um, maybe not so much new legislation influencing, but, but actually to lend the expertise, be what watchdogs and also research and finding the evidence is very, very important also in, 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 um, in uh, enforcement. And finally, don't forget, we are talking about global issues and global companies and Europe is not a fortress. So we also need to know how to engage beyond European borders because, you know, like with COVID, until we get the whole world on the same page, it's not going to resolve our problems. Wise words, Anna. Thank you. Asha, final comments before we go to the closing ceremony? I will try and be as quick as I can, but I think like uh, in Alexandra's case, you often get a short amount of time to try and get a lot of concepts across. Uh, but I would... Um, Plus one on the uh, on the ideas of kind of cross dissemination of expertise when it comes to civil society. I think there's actually opportunities for us to do the development of say legislation and operationalization processes in a much more inter institutional way. I think in part of these conversations we've talked about the kind of democratic processes and how civil society can have a real impact. And I know Claire mentioned in the in the comments there about making sure civil society remains part of the trialogues process, which is the biggest question I think for civil society right now. How do we maintain our impact in there and protect what we, uh, we've been able to win um, in the European Parliament. So really fundamentally changing as we look to the future, how do we have an actual real multi-stakeholder approach that is based on the European values of democratic participation rather than consultation after the fact or having a few people who can champion us being in those spaces, but it, it, it's not coherent. Um, and then to think forward to 2024, it's a long time in political terms, but we have to think because what we're talking about is generational defining legislation. It's going to go beyond the next five years. We need to think in those terms. So continuity, I think, is a main message um, I would pick up on. And definitely the focus on effective implementation. What we don't want with things that we have, like the DSA, is to have the same conversation that we've been having on, say, the Racial Equality Directive 20 years later, where we then say it wasn't effective, we now need to think of something else to make this work. So effective enforcement, continuity, and real inter-institutional and multi-stakeholder approach to how we do this. Fantastic summary, uh, Asha, uh, plus one to that. Alexandra, very quick words. We are already uh, over time. Otherwise, uh, yeah, you yeah. have something. Go ahead, please. I'll, I'll be very quick. Um, I think on trilogues, what the question was how to influence trilogue, um, influence national governments. I mean, the only ones who have really an influence on trilogues now um, on the pound that can change that the council position on national governments. So where you see there might be a change in national governments because there's new evidence, because there's a new political constellation or something, you have parties in that governments you can talk to. That's what we need to do and maybe coordinate a little bit with us because obviously we have an idea as well, which governments are moving in what direction. If you have any sources in council, extremely helpful. Um, use your member organization in the member states to do that. I think that's, that is what really helps. Um, let's coordinate on, on the main goals. Um, I think that's helpful. On 24 to 29, um, I have no idea. <laughs> You know, digital world is moving so fast. I one one thing I would suspect the research um, coming out of the DSA. You know, the access to the data, Article Thirty One. The work you as NGOs will be doing, the work we you as researchers will be doing, that will give us new stories, but also new evidence in order to find out which way to go. And there might be some follow-up on legislation to, to the DSA, sectoral legislation um, related to the DSA. And somehow that's something I would see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very uh, fantastic. Uh, last words. I, I Now we need to finish. We, we have three minutes uh, after the, uh, our time. Uh, we need to go to the closing ceremony, which is in the Alice room. So I just want to, to finalize. I think uh, this panel could have lasted for another hour at least. And uh, so thank you so much. Thank you, Alexandra, Anna, Asha, and Joris for being with us. Fantastic panel. So I'm looking forward to actually watch it again and take even more notes. So thank you so much and see you soon. Thank you. Goodbye.